So, the last point is that the assessment of the fabulous work Louise and others have been doing it is this, this tension um, that there's a clear, there, there's a gap uh, of several gigatons, gigatons are big numbers, um, between what the commitments appear to deliver. There's quite a range uh, in the commitments. Uh, half the range uh, relates to details of the rules and loopholes like the carry over for surplus units and those sorts of things. But uh, what appears to be the most significant issue in play is whether in the next few years we get agreement to a plausible long-term goal. And I draw that out because these temperature ranges on the side there, it's sort of around three degrees, three and a half degrees, on the current text, which doesn't include a long-term goal. If you include a long-term goal in the agreement that we hammer out in the next little while, whether that's this year or next year, you've got, you're on a 450 light trajectory. It's not probably quite 450, um, but you've got around a 50% chance of staying under two degrees, though you've got almost no chance of staying under 1.5. So if you live in the Maldives, it may be um, warm comfort, but, but the, um, the gold commitment gap could be materially closed just by that one provision. So in the paper, I go to a lot of trouble to explain geopolitics. I'm sure I don't do it nearly as entertainingly or astutely as, as Louise would do it. But essentially the point is that um, the geopolitics concerns the breadth of countries' agendas that they bring to climate change. It's got things to do like, you know, the, the, how they feel about taking action given the set of actions that other countries are offering. Um, it's quite complicated, um, but it deals mostly with form and not with substance. Substance only enters really through burden sharing, through, through sort of uh, what are we doing compared to others. Uh, we're on track to resolve issues of form, but there are some significant wild cards in there. Substance I'm much more pessimistic on, and the reason I'm much more pessimistic is that none of the major players are, are actually demonstrating leadership on global ambition. Okay, we have a situation where the EU came out early with the target range of 20 to 30. Um, if you look at the studies about burden sharing, what's reasonable, you can't find studies where that basically conclude that the EU should do the average for advanced countries. Okay? All the studies suggest that the EU should do more, and on some criteria, very substantially more than the average. And so if advanced countries are meant to be doing between 25 and 40%, the EU should be doing considerably more than 30%. And so there are some real issues about um, whether leadership is being uh, demonstrated. And there are genuine issues uh, where you've probably got an early mover penalty in the negotiation dynamics and not an early mover incentive. So it's very hard to see how that will be resolved. So I'll just skip over that. So, the last point is, a, is about narratives. So, when I opened the talk, I talked about it, economists assume sort of rational actors. Um, we focus a lot on working out what people should do, and we typically don't worry too much about what they actually do. But behavioral economics is, is making some interesting insights into that. The next few slides are about why sort of perceptions matter, why, why spin and substance are in fact not all that are separated. So the narratives, the way people talk about uh, global action in, in the negotiations ha has three main themes, that we need sort of regulations or government action to drop, drive pollution reductions. Uh, other countries will emphasize uh, inequalities and per capita emissions, and there's a baggage about historical responsibility. And it's now there's a strong theme uh, that promoting sustainable development is integral to climate change. You can't have sustainable development without action on climate change. But nobody injects this sustainable development because nobody knows what it means, and so that doesn't matter very much. So that sort of discourse is very attractive to people who are sort of uh, oriented towards communitarian values or egalitarian worldviews. They think governments are effective in acting for some reason. I'm not sure why. Um, and they, they're quite comfortable with a degree of sort of activist redistribution. The same narrative alienates people who have individualist Worldviews. They're not convinced the governments are effective actors. Um, 
they think that redistribution is in fact inequitable, it's taking away hard earned, you know, whatever it is, and giving it to people that have just sat around and not done anything. Um, and they often feel that, you know, the whole issue of climate change sort of offends sort of Adam Smith's notion of the invisible hand and that all things work for them. Um, and so we have some work to do. Now, this matters because it plays into domestic politics. You know, it's obvious uh, in, the, in the US, it's self-evident there as, as Louise has been talking. Uh, but I point out that it also narrows the base for, for the EU to move from 20 to 30%, which is integral to sort of the, the two degree assessment that I offered before. Um, uh, and the EU has no clear process at the moment for moving from one target to the other. Um, and it also reinforce, re, risk reinforcing to developing countries that you know, climate change is all about suffering now, negotiations that are all about suffering now in the hope of you know, something better in the future. Um, but they, it's often presented as a trade-off or at least a threat uh, to income growth and development and, and poverty reduction. The last thing is that underlying these sort of uh, political responses or the flim flam is, is you know, quite deep set psychology about confirmatory bias and, and protective cognition. So protective cognition is basically that people like being happy. Um, if you tell them things that <coughs> make them unhappy, they'll ignore them. Okay? It's a very good way of staying happy. It's just ignore the evidence till it's too late. Um, it may not be rational in some long-term sense, um, but it happens, and so that's the, the evidence. So this first slide is, is studies on uh, you identify people's worldviews, and then you ask them, you know, is climate change a big threat or is it a big risk? Uh, and you get these clear correlations. The first one is egalitarian versus hierarchical, uh, and the second one is communitarian versus uh, individualistic. So this is asking them about their sort of objective view of the facts. You know, is climate change a risk to our country or to you? And worldview shapes how they assess that evidence. You see this, this is um, a work with Mark Morrison and I did a while ago that, that's just come out. Uh, we did a survey where we asked people at the beginning of the survey, you know, what do you think would happen if we make deep cuts in emissions in our country? Uh, about 20% of people in the US said that incomes would fall, completely inconceivable, it's nothing to do with modelling, 25% in Australia, and when you track that through, those responses, people who think incomes would fall versus people who think uh, action on emissions would slow the increase in income, which is what the economic modelling is, is highly correlated with their confidence in the science, their acceptance of the science, and their support for action on, on, on emissions reduction. And so that, that question seems to be picking up similar sorts of core view issues here. So, you know, if you're all convinced, what does this imply for how we need to go about things? Uh, well, the first is that we need a bigger set of narratives. Okay? We don't need to stop using some of the current narratives because they're attractive to some people, but we need to be more inclusive in our narratives. And the key thing here for for the uh, economists and the policy community, is narratives are often signalled by policy mechanisms. Okay, so it's not just the science, it's the policy implications of the science, and that matters for both mechanisms and for outcomes. So at the moment we have these sorts of narratives which are appealing to the communitarians, and we have very few of the, the other narratives. Uh, and the economics community is often sort of dismisses of, of this as a as an issue because we see it as sort of, that's the politician's job, that's the marketing. Um, but it, because it relates to how we communicate, uh, it's something that we should think about as well. So this, the study I did with Mark was really looking at the framing issue of just referring to things as cost rather than opportunity cost and not, not telling people that income is right. So for example, there's a US study that divides people into two groups. One treatment is they are given a newspaper clipping where the headline is scientific panel recommends anti-pollution solution to global warming. And the text of the article is exactly the same as the little cutout box that says, you know, to reduce, uh, to stop global warming we need to do such and such. And the emphasis is on pollution reduction outcomes without any discussion of how you get there. And the other group has given the same article with a different headline. You know, panel recommends nuclear solution to global warming. Same article. You get completely different responses. Uh, and so for uh, people who are hierarchically or communitarian 
uh, in their outlook, they are more likely to accept the science of climate change if they think the implications are you have to reduce pollution. Because that appeals to the notion that you know we really did need government intervention to get things right. You can't leave the market to itself. Whereas the individualists and the egalitarians, um, they are more likely to accept the science of climate change if you tell them it implies we need to do nuclear. Because they think you know technology and innovation and human you know control and subjugation of nature um, it is is how you get to progress. So you get the same sort of thing. These are standard views uh, of modelling. Uh, output, the, the, the one on the, I keep forgetting to say, is the right, is, is very unusual in modelling reports. You know, first emphasise the opportunity cost, second one says there's an opportunity cost, but it's the nature of a foregone gain, income increases less. Uh, and the, the work that Mark and I did shows it gets substantially higher support for climate change if you give people the same information and include the information that their incomes go up. So they get a bigger information set and, and better informed and have higher support because you deal with the framing issue. Poverty alleviation. This is you know, work based on the, the Ghana Review 2008, their 450 trajectory. Oops. Um, income in developing countries increases substantially. Okay. Over our lifetimes, if they're lucky, um, uh, there won't be developing countries anymore. The developing countries are defined as countries that have average incomes below 10,000 US. They will disappear. Okay? So income growth continues, development continues in a world without climate change, even before we take account of the benefits of avoiding climate change. Uh, so what do we do? Uh, we need to bring forward uh, action on, on global carbon markets. Um, it's crucial, the last point is a substantive point, that often economists think about markets as a way of lowering the cost of achieving an outcome. In climate change, markets are fundamental to achieving the outcome. Okay, you can't achieve the outcome without markets, so it's not just a lowest cost solution. And the last thing you do is, when we're talking about countries doing more, we have to remember that narrative point. We need to communicate what more means in a whole range of different ways. And so, for example, in the US, the US, when it talks about its target, implicitly is only talking about domestic emissions. So about reducing domestic emissions. And it's giving very little attention to uh, what Australians take for granted, or at least Australians inside the tent take for granted, that you can buy international permits. And that your commitment includes is sort of a post-permit trade commitment. And so the US could keep its current permit, put a pile of money on the table for buying the forest in you know, its, its uh, sphere of influence, for example. And it doesn't have to fess up that it's achieving more. It's just meeting another sort of regional security goal or you know, buying friends and uh, making uh, a regime tacky or whatever. And so you've got multiple currencies of action and we need to give more attention to those. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you for listening. Um, we've got an economic consensus that's emerged. Uh, and if the, you're interested, hopefully I'll have cleaned up the last of the footnotes in my paper and it will be uh, on Frank's website. Um, yeah, sometime next week. Thanks very much.